going to take some time to look at a book called the Revelation Syllabus. Um, But I would like to, you, we had a question and answer session, but I would like to ask, I'd like to give you a quiz now. See if you can pass it. Maybe collectively we can come to an understanding or have some information. <clears throat> we have on the, on the chalkboard, on the whiteboard, the dates of the seven churches as traditionally known. But now, what about the seven uh, seals? Can we together collectively come up with uh, the dates of the seven seals? Do you know the dates? Anyone? Where is the first seal, approximately? <clears throat> Let's look in our Bibles now. We're talking about the seals, and I saw... Um, where, do the, where do the seals begin? <clears throat> where do they begin? Where's the first part? Revelation 6. So we perhaps could go forward in our little book here we have on the screen and, and look at it, but what is the first... Uh, what is the date of our first seal? Anyone know? Have any information about that? No? Well, I'm going to take, take us back then in our book here, some pages, before the 144,000, and go to the um, seven seals and look at this. Okay, the white horse in the wilderness. See that? Yvonne, this is page 31. Okay, you see the, the date there? We were the, right here where I'm pointing out here, the church of Ephesus. The white horse covers the same period as the um, first church. So if we were going to do the seven seals, we would have the first one would be the same period here as as this. So we're just going to put the, the dates here, 31 to 100. And then the second one, the, the red horse, see the date here of, of 100 to, to 323? Um, 323 again. May not be exactly that. Actually, there could be some differences. Then 323 to 538 would be the, the second seal, the black horse, the oppressive time where there was corruption and darkness. Um, it corresponds with the third period of the church. Spiritual hunger is portrayed in verse 6, a measure of a wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny uh, this period of time. The commodities were weighed in the balances and held by the horse's rider. Then we're going to go to the next page and look at what it says here. The, the period, uh, the next period would be, I have, I see it there at the bottom, 517. All right, souls under the altar is that during that time, sorry, I went a little fast, I guess. Here we go. The pale horse would, was described as 538 to 517. 538 to 1517. What happened in 1517? The theses, uh, the Martin Luther's 95 thesis were staples to the wall, nails to the wall. I prefer to put the date 518. 518 was when he was excommunicated, correct? Yes, so I, that's really when it hit, you know, public. 517 was the beginning, but it was really 518. 
that it had a public influence. So then the next one would be 517 to 515, uh, 1755. Uh, now, I'm gonna back up here a little bit to get more room on the chart. Okay, 1517, we'll go by what's written. And then 15 or 1755. What happened in 1755? Lisbon earthquake. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So um, it this is the souls crying under the altar. Uh, period. Pro uh, Protestant Reformation was gaining ground, and thus the martyrs who had previously been regarded as criminals now were shown to be right, or uh, at least righteous in that sense. So we come now to November 1st. What happened on November 1st? Right here. What, what was it? Sorry. See the point here uh, on page 32? We see the Lisbon earthquake. November 1st, 1755. Um, then is the next uh, time we see is the sun became black and the moon became as blood. When did that happen? May 19, 1755. And then we have the falling of the stars in November 13th, 1833. Where are these signs written in the Bible that they should be this way? The sixth seal. You okay? Where else? <clears throat> okay, Matthew 24, 21. Let's read that verse. Anybody have a marginal reference to Matthew 21, uh, 24, 21 they'd like to share? Matthew 24, 21, and 22. Okay, what do you have? Who wants to read? Who's got it? I got it. Okay, please. But then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Okay, that talks about this time. Period, but there's a text that also tells us about the uh, moon becoming as blood and so forth. Let's turn to the Revelation. This is the time that's spoken of, of the, the dark ages, we call it. And Revelation under the, under this period of time. Um, Verse 12 of chapter 6. It tells us that the, the, the sun would become black as sackcloth of hair and the moon become as blood and the stars fall from heaven and the earth uh, will be shaken as a fig tree. The star, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken. So we find also in in the Old Testament, a reference to this period of time. And I'm trying to remember where that verse is, and I can't remember it. And I didn't look it up before class. But there is an Old Testament reference for this, and I'd like you to find it. Ezekiel 32, 7. Is it Ezekiel? I don't remember it being in Ezekiel, but maybe. Who will read that verse? You 
got it? I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. Okay, that's a similar verse, but I believe that the text I'm looking for is in Joel, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um. Ezekiel, Daniel, let's see. Uh, Okay, we'll go on. We'll find that text later. So what period are we talking about now? Uh, the period of the falling of the stars. What did this, the falling of the stars have to do, um, the date particularly, have to do with the, the Advent movement? How can we explain the falling of the stars in the context of the Advent movement? How can you explain what, sorry? What is significant about the date of the falling of the stars, the last of these three signs? Oh, well, that's, that was really when uh, William Miller started preaching the 1844 message, and that's when the message really received power. And, um, well, that is the 10 years before, the 10 days before the, uh, the Day of Atonement. So we equate that to understanding of that time period that was uh, as it was in the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament. And there was time given for the people to uh, come forward with their sins and bring their lamb and so forth. And so this was a time when uh, it, it was comparable. One day for a year, we had 10 days of the blowing of trumpets, and the warning was being given from 1833 to 1843 primarily until the second angel's message uh, kicks in. So we find very important information during this period of time as to the first, second uh, angel's messages. Now we go on in our uh, analysis of the uh, seals, and right here we have first seal, second, third, fourth, fifth, and in this period we have the sixth seal, and then the seventh seal comes where? It comes in the chapter eight, because we have a time period where we go forward, and in between the uh, sixth and seventh seal, what do we have? We have chapter seven of Revelation. And what is chapter 7 about? We studied quite a bit about that. It was 144,000. And why is 144,000 um, at that point in the sealing message, right in the end? Why is the 144,000 or the chapter 7 of Revelation at that point? Because the result of the fruit of the sealing, those who accept the truth, are sealed at that time. So chapter 7 of Revelation is primarily about uh, the 144,000. Now, have you ever thought uh, to look at the, uh, let's stop for a moment and look at the 144,000. Have you ever thought to look at the names of the 144,000? and compare them with the names of the children of, of Israel. So your homework today, your homework today, write it down. Your homework today is to look at the list of the 144,000, I mean the uh, children of Jacob, note differences, note the differences between the list found in the Bible and other places. There's many places that it's given, and they're not always the same. But note the difference between that and the list found in, the hundred and, in uh, Revelation chapter 7. And then define the names. Go to the concordance, look up their names, and 
put it beside their name. What each name means in the order that you find them in Revelation chapter 7. And your homework will be to write a sentence or a paragraph based upon those names as they're written on the names, on the definition of those names. What was the, what was the first part when you were saying that we had to compare this list to another list? Or? Well, where's the list of their names written? Genesis 49. 49 is one place where they're all listed. And in Revelation, but their list is different. There's three lists, right, in the Bible? At least three. There are more, actually, where they're mentioned. The order of the tribes are mentioned. So how many of the, of the lists do you want? You only need the first one. So Genesis and Revelation. Yes, Genesis and Revelation. So we just compare and we, uh, just, we look at Just, just take a comparison. That, yeah. that doesn't matter that much that you come up with any kind of analysis for the list in Genesis, but look at the name of the uh, look at the names in Revelation and, and replace their names in a paragraph, in a sentence, so you can read it. So the paragraph is just about uh, defining the name and what it means? All you're doing is taking the name, replacing with their definition, and putting it in a sentence or in a, in a paragraph, okay, and see what it comes out to. be interesting to see how, how well you do with that. It, it should take you a little while, but it'll be good practice in the concordance, looking up the names, looking up the definition, and so forth, taking care of those things. So now we come to... The last uh, trumpet, the seventh trumpet, which uh, takes us to the end of time, because we're right now between the sixth and seventh trumpet. And for today's lesson, we're going to just, uh, you're going to help me to read these paragraphs, because we're going to take our lesson from this book, the seminar syllabus on Revelation. So I ask you to, to help out and read these things, and we can discuss some of the issues involved. All right? Who would like to be a part? How about you, Adrian? You would like to start for us, please? Sure. <coughs> yes, the series of the seven trumpets actually begins in verse 2. All right, now let's turn to verse 5, please. Because it says here that the differences are based upon verse 5. But we're going to read, uh, as we read this, we're going to read up to verse, uh, verses uh, 5, 3, 4, and 5. Now let's point out, again, something about the Revelation in all Bible, not only prophecy, but in many, many places. What we have is an introduction. We have a period or a, a writing here which is summary. This, these verses are summary of what is to come. 
in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, is a summary verse. And then verses 25, 26, and 27 are an explanation, or an expansion, or uh, a recapitulation with uh, more information. So we read here in verse 5 of chapter 8, and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire and the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. All right, now, this, these verses, three, four, five, and possibly six, uh, actually three, four, and five mostly, are, they are a summary of what is to come. And this is quite often the case in Scripture. So if we don't take this in its context in this way, we will have a different way of understanding the verses, understanding the seven trumpets. But because we can understand this as being an outline, a quick summary, then we can see that this is pointing to something very special. What is happening here with the censer? It says the censer was cast out or, or put down, the smoke of the censer and the prayers of the saints and so forth. And he took, the angel took it and filled it with fire and cast it into the earth. This is a symbol. What does this symbol hearken to you or tell you? Well, it tells us that this is when, uh, when Christ throws down the censer, what's going to happen? What he, when he throws down the censer, means that he's finished his priestly duties. The end of probation. So this verse shows us, that this three, these three verses show us the summary of the whole of the seven trumpets. And it's leading to what event? To the judgment. Now let's turn to chapter 11 where all this comes to culmination. Read chapter 11, verse um, uh, 17. Wait a minute, got the wrong verse. It's um, 19. What happened in Revelation 11, 19? It says, And the trump temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testimony, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake. Is that very similar to what we've heard here in this verse? Yes, it's quite the same. Very similar uh, language. So this verse here in chapter 8, verse 5, is the introduction, and the fulfillment then is in Revelation 11, verse 19. So now we, having done a little bit of hermeneutics here, seeing uh, these two verses being similar, now we can understand clearly verse um, Five, what it's pointing to, that it's a summary outline verse, and it's pointing clear over to Revelation 11, verse 19. And what is in between is summarized here in verses 3 and 4. We see in verses 3 and 4 another angel, or different and separate from the seven John had already seen. The altar we can compare to Exodus chapter 31 through 10. This obviously refers to the altar of incense. So where is the altar of incense? In the holy place. In the holy place. Interesting to look at the history of the altar of incense. It's actually sometimes considered in the most holy place because it also pertains to that part of the sanctuary service. So the Galton altar was before the throne. You see that word, before the throne? Or the ark. On earth it stood before the second veil first uh, second messages, and so forth. So verses 5 and 6, the angel fills the censer in the second, uh, the second time with fire only, no incense. What do you think that means, without incense? What, are, what is the incense in, ver in chapter 5? The prayers of the saints. But what, what, did the pray, uh, what did the saints pray for? What are we told to pray for in the Bible? For the Holy Spirit, 
We're to pray for our leaders, are we not? Are we not to pray for those who have the rule over us? We are to pray that our flight be not in the winter nor on the Sabbath day and different things like that. But this, it says, fire only, no incense. So this indicates also that the prayer for, remember we read in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16, there's a prayer, uh, there's a, a sin unto death. I do not say you should pray for it. What are the saints going to be doing during the time of trouble when the probation closes? What are they going to be praying for? That all their sins have been uh, confessed. So they're not going to be praying for the world because what happened with the world? It's just closed. It's probation's closed. There is a sin that you're not supposed to pray for. What is that? When they sin rejected action. the Spirit of God and condemned the messenger and therefore they have come to the point of no return. So no incense means there's not going to be any more prayers offered up for the salvation of souls. So the judgments are now cast into the earth. In other words, no incense, no mercy. The angel's sensation of ministry in the altar is symbolic of Christ's sensation of ministry in the heaven uh, and the end of the probation. So the voices, thundering, and lightnings in the earthquake all point to the event of Revelation 11, 19. Then the voice comes, it is done. Revelation 16, 17. So when we look at the, if we look at the context of the seven trumpets here, it's preparing us to see the rest of the Revelation for chapters 12 through 22, particularly chapters 16, 17, and so forth, um, where, where the seven last plagues are. So now we come down and uh, look at the verses here. Let's read again. Who will read verses 3, 4, 5, and 6? Danny, do you have it? Would you read it for us? Because now we're just going to read again what we just talked about. Revelation 7? Eight. Revelation 8. 3, 4, 5, and 6. Yeah, we, we just read, we just talked about that, but now let's read it. Okay. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and it was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices, and thunderings, and lightnings, and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepare themselves to sound. So the seven angels prepare themselves to sound. This is kind of now gone back to um, the beginning again, and we come to the first trumpet. The beginning of the vision runs ahead of its chronological line to show us what is the final result of all the commotion. The trumpets are now ready to be blown. So the first part is basically introductory. Now we're going to look at um, verse 7, the first trumpet. The first trumpet represents the invasion of the Goths under Alaric against the Roman Empire. We place these invasions around the fourth century, the various attacks of the, on the Roman Empire, which had become internally weak, are also called the migration of nations. So let's read verse 7. Danny, again, would you read verse 7? The first angel sounded, the, sorry, the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of, of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. So we read some different things here um, about hail. Um, it seems to be indicative that it's coming out of the north. And hail, of course, is very damaging. How, how, how many of you have lived or seen uh, hailstones of any size? Yes. Yes. Uh, pretty damaging. Of course, we're going to have hail at the seventh um, plague, and it's going to be quite uh, damaging. So fire points of destruction and flames of both city and countryside. Alaric must have practiced um, scourged earth techniques. So he seems to have been a very um, 
diligent soldier in that he destroyed everything in his past so that the enemy wouldn't have any uh, thing to use as resources when uh, following after him. Blood, it says, merciless and terrible slaughter of men, women, and children. Historians have mentioned the same terms um, that John mentions here, such as trees and grass, referring to the general destruction left behind by Alaric. The second trumpet, verses 8 and 9. Um, I'm trying to get a date for this period. I believe I have it in another book. Um, the date for this period. Um, hmm. Okay. The date for the first trumpet is said to be uh, approximately this period of time was 378, 378 to about 411. This is the time of Alaric. Now we come to the second trumpet. Danny, would you read again verses 8 and 9? And it says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. This is quite interesting if we apply this to history. Um, for we see that uh, points to a great naval conflict. Um, Gennesaret and his vandals. Our common word vandalism, of course, comes from this. One third of the part of the sea became blood. One third of the creatures died in the sea. And one third of the part of the ships were destroyed. This mentions the third part refers to the division of the Roman Empire after Constantine's death among his three sons, Constantius, Constantine II, and Constance. Those three people were uh, where the his kingdom was divided. So it seems to have happened in this time. So one-third of these was um, their power was taken away. In our prophecy, we deal with the last third part of the Roman Empire. So the scene of action here is off the coast of Africa and part of Italy, where Gennesaret maintained a strong fleet of pirate vessels operated from Carthage on the North African coast. What is Carthage? Anybody know anything about Carthage? It was first a um, pilot city of Rome, but it became great, and then it became the enemy of Rome. So Carthage was the, one of the cities that was um, uh, very much in the forefront of um, fighting or taking over Roman territories and resources. So Gennesaret gathered about 300 long galleys and many support vessels in the port of um, Cartagena in Spain to attack uh, uh, Gennesaret. Excuse me. Who did that? Um, let's see now. Gennesaret maintained a strong fleet of pirate vessels that operated from Carthage on the north coast. Emperor Majoran made a careful preparation to wipe out his enemy. He gathered 300 long galleys and many support vessels in the port of Cartagena in Spain to attack Gennesaret. Gennesaret was informed about his plans and unexpectedly appeared before the large port of Cartagena. Barges filled with combustible materials were driven among the moored ships, this happened in the middle of the night, uh, and this was uh, Emperor Marjoram, his Roman ships. Here is the burning mountain of prophecy. Gennesaret maintained the scourging of the Romans. Tripoli and Sardinia returned to his camp in Sicily, also was added to his realm. Before he died, he saw the extension of the Western Roman Empire. So Gennesaret, um, it was very interesting to read about this battle. 
And he heard about all these ships that were being prepared against him. Actually, he asked for a truce, um, prepared these barges, and sent them in among all these ships, and something like, it says, I don't know, 10,000 men died, or 100,000, I can't remember the numbers. But uh, there was a great victory on the side of Gennesaret, and the Romans lost much of their power. So this was a dynamic time for uh, the explanation of prophecy to point towards such an event. In verse 10, again, let's go on and read what is said here. Danny, would you again help us out? Sure. <clears throat> and uh, the, third, the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Okay, we have the, first of all, we have the time period of the second uh, trumpet had to be uh, after this time, although we're going to look back now at the third trumpet here, we have Attila the Hun. Now, in 1886 to 1888, there was a great argument about whether the Huns were to be part of the ten tribes or whether it was to be the Alemanni. Um, but we see here that the Huns uh, were like a, uh, a shooting star, a falling star. How long does a falling star last? Pretty quick. Pretty quick, a second or so. And so Adela was like that in his attack on Rome. He didn't last really as far as a, a permanent power is concerned. So. The Huns were people who settled around the Danube in 8372, uh, although the rule of the Huns did not last very long. Their reign was very cruel. They sowed death everywhere. And that description is very appropriate here. The star fast in its rise and fall, brilliant in its uh, import. So the rivers and fountains of waters, we interpret this similarly as we did the sea, actually, which says salt water. Fresh bodies of water would make us look toward the mountainous region of the Alps where the rivers of Europe began their course. Historian Gibbon states, the whole breadth of the Europe as it extends from the uh, Euxine Black Sea to the Adriatic was at once invaded, occupied, and desolated by myriads of barbarians whom Attila led in the field. It's called wormwood, which means a bitterness. Um, he styled himself as the scourge of God. He said that the, ha oh, that the grass would never go, grow under the horse, uh, the, wherever his foot of, the, of his horse had trod. So he was a very um, uh, able leader and also, of course, a very cruel one. We don't have the dates here as, as such, but we come now to uh, verses 11 and 12. 11 where you have uh, wormwood and 12 is the fourth trumpet. The fourth trumpet comes um, with the Haruli and Odeker. So who will read that text for us? Danny again, please. 11 and 12? Yes. And the name of the star is called wormwood, and the third part of the waters became wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Okay, we already mentioned Wormwood, uh, the scourge of God. In verse four, 12, we read the fourth trumpet. The third part of the sun, the moon, and the stars was smitten. We here have the work of Odeker of the Haruli. He was very closely connected with the downfall of Western Rome. The symbols of the sun, moon, and stars point to the luminaries of the Roman Empire, its emperors, senators, and councils. The work of Odeker led to the um, poor excuse of a government under the Exarch of Ravenna. Or there's some discussion and controversy about this which we're not going to go into now. But the Exarch of Ravenna, I don't believe, amounted to very much. The four trumpets thus finished off the Roman Empire. Its glory was laid in the dust by the barbaric invasions, and what was to follow was even worse. 
So we have the downfall of Rome coming here uh, in this period. This is, of course, in around 450 or so. Now we have three vows. How many trumpets have come? Four trumpets. And the last four, th three trumpets are associated with three woes. So when was um, Rome finally sacked and burned? What was the date? This is a very important date, and you need to remember it. 476. That date is when um, Rome was burned and sacked for the third time. What happened at that point? in the history of Rome. Well, um, the, um, the power of Rome was ceded to the Bishop of Rome, and uh, eventually it developed into the papacy. So we have then the first four woes, or the first four trumpets, and then we have the three woes which follow. Um, so we're going to take a break again at this point. I know it's a little bit early, but we've gone through chapter 8. Any questions or thoughts about chapter 8? I, had, I invite you to read the book of Revelation, Daniel Revelation, on this subject by Uriah Smith. Let's see if we can come up with the dates. So all the first four trumpets are talking about... The fall of Western Rome. The fall of Western Rome, which happened... Summary of the first four trumpets is the fall of Western Rome. Okay, and that occurred in 476 AD. Yes, the final fall of Rome, 476. So it's basically referring to the fall of pagan Rome and, or Western mm -hmm. Rome. Yes. Okay. That's where we summarize that. That's how we, now there's very many different interpretations of trumpets. Some very elaborate uh, ideas about the trumpets. Some are saying even that the trumpets are actually the same thing as the seven last plagues. They are not. So there, are, there is differences. So there's no link between the trumpets and the seven last plagues? Yeah. There is a link in the organization of the book. Because we have the first half of Daniel, and this, I mean the first half of Revelation, and the second half of Revelation. So there is some kind of parallelism hmm. between the two. Because we're seeing now the... the the churches are the messenger. The seals are how the message is received. Because that's why we have the sealing in the middle of the seals. And then we have the judgments of God applied over the historical period of the churches for rejecting the message. Now, we see all that at the end of Revelation. Let's look at one text that's very interesting and kind of analyze it in this context. Revelation 18, verse 24. Revelation 18, verse 24. So we see that over time, these, pro, uh, these trumpets were uh, basically the result of rejecting the message that, was, that God had brought to the world at this time. And now what happened to the church? The church failed to be giving the message. So the people who were giving the message were being slaughtered and had to go into hiding to survive. Now, if we look in Revelation 18, 24, it says, And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Who is her here? Who is her in this verse? And in her was found. Papacy. The Babylon the Great. Okay, Babylon the Great. In her was found the blood of all the prophets and all the saints that were slain upon the earth. So what we read here in this text is that even the blood of Abel was counted to her to have been slain by her. Did she slay Abel? No. Well, be careful now because Cain was the beginning of the opposition of God's people on earth. He was the beginning of this. Of course, it says Nimrod was the beginning, but the spirit of Abel, I mean the spirit of Cain after the flood was taken up by Nimrod. So Nimrod, is the, it says, the, in here was all the blood. So when they had killed the saints, when they had condemned God's people at the end of time, 
they make themselves guilty of all those who had done the same in the past. So here we find a interesting text in chapter 18. Um, we need to think about how God looks at the history and the actions of, of nations and people. So when they do the same thing that their forefathers had done, they are accounted to have uh, participated in, the, in those same exact acts. So what we're mentioning here is the seven trumpets is the God's judgment against the world um, the Western world at that time. And notice one thing very interesting about the, uh, the process of history. As we look at the, the prophets, as they spoke of the development of the Babylonian, the Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, there's always a Western development of the prophecies, a Western movement of the center of interest. We go from Babylon to meet a Persia, to Greece, to Rome, to Europe, and then where do we go? What, where do we go after Europe? Where's west of Europe? The Atlantic, right? And what's west of the Atlantic? The New World. So we see a westward progression like of the sun of history. So that's how the Bible uh, is following the events, and that's why when we get to Revelation 13, we see the power of the second beast as pointing to 